Hello and welcome. You're watching To The Point. Can the collegial system of choosing judges be made more acceptable and transparent? Can the National Judicial Appointments Commission be changed in a way to make it acceptable to the Supreme Court? Those are the two key issues I shall explore today with India's Attorney General Mukul Rahotgi. Attorney General, speaking about its plans to amend and alter the collegium system, the Supreme Court has said, and I'm quoting, it's not going to be a wholesome change. It has to be within parameters. We will have to limit it. How do you respond to that? See, uh, Karan, I want to make two points. One, when the Supreme Court struck down the constitutional amendment in the Act, because they thought that it will affect the independence of the judiciary. All the judges, by and large, were critical of the way the collegial system has functioned. Therefore, firstly, if the system which you want to bring back has been faulty for the last so many years, I think it's rather anachronistic or contradictory that you strike down something which is a new experiment and bring back something which you admit has many problems. That's one. Two, to say that we will do only tinkering with the system and we can't really touch the, the, the broad skeleton of the system, I think is also contradictory in a way. If it has ills, the ills must be removed. But I must tell you why the court has said that. The collegium system was put in place by a nine-judge bench. To make wholesale changes, it can only be done by a nine-judge bench. Or more. Or more, at least nine. So that's the hierarchy in the courts. Five can't upset what nine has done. Therefore, they are feeling constrained in touching or going to the root of the whole system. That is the reason. Two things follow from what you are saying. First of all, if they are only going to tinker and not make root and branch structural changes, then basically the ills of the collegium system will continue and there will be no benefit. And secondly, if they really are serious about improving the system, then they need a nine-judge nine bench or more and they haven't gone for it. I In would, either event, they are contradicting themselves. I would agree uh, wholeheartedly with you on both the points. So in fact then, this decision to amend is not only deficient and disappointing, but it won't actually lead to changes the country needs. Un undoubtedly, it will not. And ultimately, Karan, if it is kind of a closed club or a closed group which consists only of judges and you are not willing to have any other person sitting with you, it's all very well to look at uh, you know, objections, suggestions and all that. Unless you let in fresh air and sunshine is the best disinfectant. Unless you do that, allow somebody to sit with you, whether it's eminent lawyers, eminent members of the society, somebody who can criticize that, look, what you're doing is not correct. And let it not be confined to a room. Unless you do that, and that is the way the, the rest of the world has gone forward. Unless you do that, the yields will continue, some tightening here, some tightening there, according to me, will not lead to any, uh, any great situation. So to sum up this small part of the interview, what you're really saying to me is that you have no great expectations of changes that will make the collegium system substantially improved. Absolutely right. So if the country thinks that there's going to be a sea change, the country is wrong. Completely. Let's then come to the four areas that the Supreme Court has specified which they claim they wish to address. I'm going to take you through each of them one by one. To begin with the issue of transparency. Even judges themselves have accepted in their judgments yes. that the collegium system is opaque and secretive. In your opinion, how important is the very issue of transparency? I think it is the most important issue. And as I just said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. A transparent system will bring with itself efficiency, accountability, lack of arbitrariness. Why? Firstly, you must record reasons that you have considered five people, five judges are sitting together, they consider five names. Till now, there are no minutes of the collegium worth speaking. It's two lines. We recommend A, we don't recommend B. 
we defer C, we defer D. That's it. Why you have recommended A? Why you have not recommended B? All that must be put down at least briefly. It is elementary that when you record reasons, you show application of mind and you show non-arbitrariness. That is basic in every decision. So once you start doing that, recording reasons, etc., etc. What we have also proposed is, as a lawyer in the High Court, sometimes I won't even know, or in the Supreme Court, that some judge's appointment process is on. It's not on the web, it's not on the net, it's not in the newspapers, no applications are called. By word of mouth, if you senior judges decide that Mr. Thapar is a good lawyer, let's ask him. If you agree, your name goes through. So you should have applications. You should have a fixed criteria that a lawyer with 20 years standing, with income of 10 lakhs, who has appeared in 100 cases, etc., etc., is the benchmark which we suggest. So you invite applications, you screen them, you put it in a dossier, you you uh, you uh, arrange it in you know in merit, see regional representation, see minorities, then take a call, then record. This is the most important issue. You said some very, very important things there. For the sake of the layman who may not follow as well as lawyers do, I'm just going to repeat the critical bits for your confirmation. First of all, you're saying that the entire minutes of the collegium in detail need to made, be public. Yes. People need to know who was considered. They need to know who was accepted, who was rejected, why accepted, why rejected, why deferred. Those details must be made public. Am I right on that? Yes. The second thing you're saying is we need to know who are the candidates in the zone of consideration. Yes. Their names must be made public. Yes. Now, one step further, would you also say that input should be requested from bar associations and yes. other eminent people who know about these so oh, that yes. publicly we are told what their merits or demerits are? Absolutely right. We have said eminent members of the bar are the true barometer of the standing of a lawyer. They know whether that lawyer by and large is good or bad. See, the problem now is most chief justices come from outside the state. So, chief justice is the head of the collegium in the high court. Two other judges. Very often, they are also outside, from outside the state. They don't know anything about the local bar. They rely upon judge number three, four, five, six. So, if you rely upon outsiders to look for insiders for information, a chief justice stays for six months. What can he recommend? A lawyer may have appeared in his court only once. This is why it's so important that eminent people, yes. bar associations, be asked to bar their advice. Bar associations, eminent lawyers, maybe eminent citizens, governor, chief minister. This is a part of the constitution. It, 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 it's supposed to be a, a holistic meeting of views to select the best. And the Supreme Court said in the ninth judge, it is better to sacrifice a good appointment at times then to take in a bad appointment. What this about what about something else? Is it also essential that in the process of selection you should have closed or interviews with the candidates? That is what I have suggested. It has never been there. Now we are sitting, Karan, facing each other. You can ask me questions. I can ask you questions. So many people are watching, right? If you if you just look at a few papers and you decide that I got input from here and input from there about this man as if it's an anonymous entity, as if you're appointing a class 3 or a class 4 person, it's a different thing. But when you look at a lawyer, you look in his face, you look into his eyes and ask him, tell me, how many cases have you actually done? Because very often you get, you know, you can put your name as a man who's argued a case, but he may not have argued the case. He may not be the lead lawyer. He may not be the lead, he may not have argued. You will ask him 10 basic questions or reasonably, a little above the basic, please tell us what is the article dealing with proclamation of emergency. Please tell us how um, constitution is amended. Please tell us this. Four, five, six questions will tell you who is in uh, what kind of situation. And should these be closed door interviews or should they be, as some people are suggesting, on television and public like US Senate hearings? Well, I think Karan, that is too far. a little too far. In America, the process is political also. You see, let's not go that far. An, a good beginning will be this. And if people know that somebody is watching, somebody is recording, and we have suggested that keep the records of the Collegium for 30 years, 
because the public records act says 30 years keep it for scholars and then give them to the archives so that they are open for everyone for, and for research now there is one argument that has been made in court against the sort of transparency you're talking about it's made by a very eminent lawyer a former solicitor general gopal subramaniam for the sake of the audience i'm going to quote what he said the moment information gets leaked about a person being considered by the collegium at the supreme court or high court level immediately vested interests swing into action they launch a motivated campaign to deride and defame the person in the zone of consideration and now you know and i know and it's no great secret mr subramaniam has himself suffered, suffered but yes. is that a reason for limiting no. transparency karan there can be no reason higher then transparency you cannot sacrifice transparency because there will be a flood of complaints i may tell you once it gets known in a local high court then so and so's name is being considered lot of complaints are engineered anyway so if 100 complaints are engineered and it is put on the net 500 complaints are engineered that can never be uh, be enough to sacrifice transparency because transparency will bring in merit it will bring in non arbitrators the fact that people will either criticize you or make up criticisms is a fact of life you have to live with exactly how does it matter if you criticize most of the complaints 90% i have seen in the government are frivolous and they have no material so you check them away 5 10% complaints may have something give it to the executive and they look at it now a second area where the supreme court has said they want to bring about change is in creating criteria for eligibility but the question is who will create those criteria judges or should you have bar associations or should you also have eminent persons with standing and knowledge see girl this is a very important question as the constitution stands it has only bare eligibility a lawyer who has practiced for 7 years or something or 10 years in the high court is eligible to become a judge it is nothing else and obviously you are a lawyer it is nothing else in practice the they have uh, you know defined some some broad eligibilities like by and large you should be 45 to be mature by and large you should have 3 to 4 lakhs income to show that you are reasonably okay stuff like that and you should not be uh, there should not be any allegations against you in my view strictly speaking this is the job of parliament if parliament prescribes eligibility for class 3 class 2 class 1 and for every other post this is really meant for parliament so parliament has to do this yes. not judges not lawyers no it is actually parliament because only very basic eligibility as i said is given by the constitution the flesh and blood must come from in from a local act of parliament to fill up the constitution now as you know yesterday the supreme court actually invited yes. suggestions from the lay public yes. they've said that they can give them till the 13th of november 5 pm yes. will those suggestions be meaningful or is that just a popular gesture and nothing more i would not put it just as a gesture the court seems to to feel that something good may come out of it hundreds of people will make uh, suggestions maybe one or two suggestions are good the attempt is in the right direction but as i said uh, it's kind of you know going round and round at the end of the day it will not fetch what it is supposed to your crystal clear position is that setting criteria for eligibility for judges is the job of parliament yes. and therefore when parliament does it these criteria will be public yes they will be known of course and therefore when candidates are chosen people can judge whether they match up or whether they fail it's very simple the njac has been struck down currently so currently the power of selection is with the judges but as you said the zone of consideration the levels of eligibility the levels of qualifications have to be prescribed by parliament leaving the manner of selection to the judges as it stands but parliament has the power to change the basis of this current verdict and get back uh, i'll come to that issue about oh. parliament having the power to change the basis of this verdict in a moment time yeah. but the interesting thing is even within the scheme of improving and making the collegium system more efficient and transparent there is a clear role for parliament there too because the setting of eligibility criteria is the parliament's Absolutely. job you say right. 
Now, the third area where, in fact, the Supreme Court believes that change is needed within the collegium system is they say a secretariat is needed for the collegium. Presumably, that secretariat has to operate under the Supreme Court. Therefore, it must be the Supreme Court's owners to set it up. Am I right? Yeah, but one thing I'd like to tell you, not, not entirely. The suggestion to set up a permanent secretariat came from me, that is the government, and from a large section of lawyers. Because you can't have an ad hoc system. To, at the moment, it is ad hoc. And let me tell you how. Say three judges of the Supreme Court form the collegium. Now, they are in court from 10 to 4. And after 4, they have to write judgments, do a lot of administrative work. So, somewhere in the middle at 4, before the judges go home from 4 to 4.30 or 5, a collegium meeting is squeezed in. In that collegium meeting, the registrar will come and say, or they will have record to say, that 10 judges have to be appointed of the High Court, some recommendations have been made, please look at it and take a call. So you take a call. So the meeting will not have regularity. You can meet once in three months, you can meet once every day, once two, twice a week or whatever, whatever. So if you have a proper secretariat, but secretariat is important provided you ask for applications from the bar, people apply, there is a fixed you know, a, a brochure, you read, you, you verify, make a dossier, tell the government, look at this, look at that, and then the secretariat has a, a, a job all the time to monitor how many judges are, you know, positions are getting vacant. Are we uh, having proper pace to fill them up? Because the judge's retirement is known. I mean, there's no... And has to be planned for. You should be... I have suggested at least six months. So you're saying that the secretariat on its own is insufficient. It has to work in combination with everything else we've talked about. Yes, and it should be a permanent wing of the Supreme Court. Now, fourthly, the Supreme Court has also said that they need what's called a complaint redressal mechanism. And presumably, yeah. these will be complaints against judges. Yes. Therefore, the mechanism can't consist of other judges because judges are not going to judge judges very effectively. So, who should be members of this complaint redressal mechanism? No, I, I will answer. Uh, I presume that you are talking about prospective applicants who will become judges and people make complaints. See, as is found in the government, complaints which are anonymous are just chucked into the waste paper basket. They are never examined and rightly so. If you don't have the courage to make a complaint, then it is useless. By and large, as I have seen, large number of complaints have no basis except to say, that this lawyer in this case was mixed up with the judge. I mean, it means nothing. You can't examine something like this. A lawyer has appeared in thousands of cases. But if there is some basis, suppose there is a complaint which says that this judge, this prospective applicant has or is related to such and such judge and that judge is in the collegium and there may be a conflict of interest or this judge last year had a return of 5,25,000 and in the next three years his return from 5 lakhs has gone to 1 crore and 5 lakhs. Therefore there is some hanky-panky or some tie-up with somebody. Something like that. Now the complaints have to be examined only by a system which has some mechanism. The mechanism is available only with the executive. That is with IB, CBI local police, whatever. The authorities who have the facilities. Yes, because this has happened for the last 50 years. It's nothing new. So then you're saying that the complaints mechanism has to be not in the hands of judges. Yeah. It has to be in the hands a, of an independent party and likely a party that comes under the executive. Obviously, the judges will have to give it to them and they will look at the complaints and give it away. Last 50 years it has happened, it's nothing new. So judges can't judge complaints yeah, against because judges? Because they don't have no mechanism. Absolutely. Yeah. It has to be some branch of the executive, yeah. intelligence or accountants or CAG or whatever. Exactly. Two quick questions before I come to the NGAC. If the changes the Supreme Court is talking about, and I know that you feel that they're inadequate, they're just tinkering, they're not really going to be wholesale yeah. and root and branch. But if these changes do happen, yeah. Will we see an increase in women lawyers? And I ask for one reason. The Supreme Court itself has said that the proportion of women judges has to match the number of women lawyers. And you know and I know that the number of women lawyers is a minuscule proportion of male lawyers. So does that mean that in fact we're not going to see any increase in women judges? I hope we do. And Karan, I can only tell you in my limited experience at the bar that I have found that women judges even though did not have that amount of exposure 
as lawyers because you generally don't have but by and large they made better judges than men in the high court and the supreme court. but will this change no matter how limited it is lead to more women judges or is that unlikely i am sanguine about it i cannot say what will happen because if you have to make more judges even without this system you can have more judges women lawyers it's the will that counts not exactly. the system exactly how does it matter one other question before i come to the ngac at the moment more judges are needed there are vacancies that have to be filled fadi nariman in court said that the collegium system as it is without amendments without changes should go ahead and fulfill those vacancies gopal subramaniam on the other hand has said no we need to wait until you adjust amend and restructure the system where do you stand should this existing system without changes fulfill vacancies or should we wait till no current it should fulfill we have a level of 38% vacancies of the high court as high as that 38% means out of about 1000 odd strength of judges in the high court you have 38% only functioning it is a very worrying thing people are languishing in jail if a system has carried on for 22 years and you are only going to tighten the system there is it is inexplicable as to why the collegium is not functioning i must tell you i find it completely inexplic inexplicable this five judge bench has not stopped the collegium the collegium consists of three senior judges of the supreme court we who are not in this uh, the bench if they have not stopped why should the collegium not uh, function it should appoint people judges are retiring like nine pins and every man who's languishing in jail or is outside uh, his house or whatever is losing six months at one go because one date will mean six months and six months in a man's life are just gone because you don't have a judge i think it is it is criminal not to not to fill up in fact it's not just inexplicable that the collegium system isn't functioning is unforgivable as well well and it's leading to injustice absolutely so let's now come to the national judicial appointments commission i'm going to quote what you said speaking in the supreme court parliament should have the power to make any law within the parameters of the constitution to govern the criteria and process for appointment of judges to the supreme court and high courts does that mean that you retain the right should you and the government so want to exercise it to come up with a new version of the ngac in the hope that the supreme court will this time accept it absolutely right it is undoubtedly the power of parliament to do this parliament has power to amend the constitution the supreme court has the right to decide whether the amendment is within the contours of the constitution but you can try as often as you want oh yes it has happened for the last 50 years nothing new Let many me... many times the, the the parliament has removed the basis of a judgment and done it let me come to the three main reasons why people believe the supreme court struck down the old ngac and ask whether you think amendments there are possible people say one area where the supreme court had problems was the fact that judges on the old ngac would have parity not a majority would you be happy with the new structure where judges had a majority say they were 3 out of 5 or 4 out of 7 well uh, karan if you are 3 out of 5 the the right therefore remains with you it is possible if you have five people and out of which you have three judges and there is no veto etc then majority takes the call right the other two maybe a law minister and maybe somebody else will generally have over the years will become a defeatist kind of an attitude that whatever we say is going to be overrun by by those three right so big deal uh, let them say whatever they are i am a glorified babu i am sitting here but not going to really matter yes. so that is not according to be appropriate you're saying a very interesting thing you're saying by giving judges a majority rather than just parity you're actually diminishing the others to the point at which yes. they might not even believe they have a role to play exactly exactly this leads to the second issue many people say that what the judges didn't like about the old ngac was the fact that two d people dissenting was a veto should that veto be done away with no, should it be retained should it yeah. be diluted something i must tell you karan and the, i don't think the public is aware in the collegium system framed by nine judges they have said that when five judges are sitting in the collegium and two out of five say no they can be overridden by three 
but the convention is that if two judges out of five say no, the appointment does not go through. We have only picked this and called it a veto. It's just calling it a veto. That's what we have done. There's one if it is good for the goose, it's good for the gander. There's only one difference, Mr. Rahotki. Yeah. That convention, for all we know, yeah. may well have been overlooked and ignored because we don't know how the system functioned. Now, when you have a formal veto, it can't be overlooked and ignored. Maybe that's something that worries judges. Not really, because it's a, it's a matter of written law, written uh, memorandum of procedure, that if two judges say no in the collegium, the appointment doesn't go through. All we have said is, if two people say no here, and those two could be judges, it's not only, why do we believe that there will be a conflict? One judge and one eminent person, or one judge and a law minister can get together and say, we don't agree, let the others uh, say whatever they want. So your considered opinion is that retaining the veto is important? Yes. And the veto should be of two people dissenting or should it be just one? It is better to have two, because one will become arbitrary. One will show that, you know, I have a right which is higher than all the others. So two people. And, and two is taken, as I told you, from what the judges have done. So if that is good, then this is good. In That's other all. words, the Supreme Court has no real basis to complain about the veto because their convention, yes. and one assumes That's they observed right. their convention, That's and right. that they weren't hypocrites. That's right. Therefore, if they object to the veto, they're contradicting themselves. Should I put it in one line? If the veto of two judges is good to block an appointment, surely a veto of two eminent people, maybe a judge himself, maybe the law minister, Maybe eminent people chosen by the prime minister, leader of opposition, etc., of the uh, uh, you know a subcommittee of the highest level. If they say no, sacrifice a good appointment. Don't allow a bad appointment. This is the mantra which goes through the nine judges. And the other thing, as Harish Salve in an earlier interview on this program said to me, that the advantage of the veto is it ensures that you don't have what he called the tyranny of the majority of judges. Because exactly. who's the guarantee to say the judges won't push through a bad choice? I entirely agree. Coupled with the fact that some minutes will be maintained, those two people will write. They can't say, I mean, I don't like you because you're black hair or white hair. They'll write something. It can't be arbitrary. It won't be arbitrary. And there is posterity to, to, to check. Finally, that. one of the concerns it said with the old NJAC was the fact that there were eminent persons involved. One of your judges even said that civil society hasn't reached a point of maturity where eminent persons can play a critical role. He even claimed that, in fact, the press and civil society don't have the capacity to speak out in favor of fundamental rights, which, of course, is disputed by the facts, but leave that aside. Should eminent persons be part of any new NGAC you create? According to me, firstly, the learned judge was wrong in making a statement of fact that the Indian polity is today not ready. Because his facts were wrong. They have said so, that it is not ready. But let me tell you, the Supreme Court has said since independence that it is only parliament knows the needs of its people. Otherwise, it is a very dangerous track to go on. Parliament feels the age of voting should be 21. The court feels it should be 23. Parliament feels you should be driving at such and such age. Parliament, the court will feel something else that is not acceptable. The wisdom of parliament in deciding what is good for its people is solely within the jurisdiction of parliament. That's number one. So if parliament decides that this is it, it is good or bad for the system, it is so. Number two, if eminent people are there, and the idea is, as I told you, they are selected by uh, uh, triumvirate of the prime minister, the leader of opposition, and one more person. Chief Justice. Chief Justice. And everybody respects the Chief Justice. I don't foresee that these three people will sit together and they will be at loggerheads. Certainly they, the leader of the opposition and PM won't. will never meet. So they will choose the best. And let me tell you, suppose Mr. Karan Thapar is added as an eminent person. I don't think I'll have an objection. Because I want a person who's fair-minded, who's literate, who knows the realities, and who can either side with these two judges or side with them and what's wrong with you know involving some element who is the stakeholder ultimately Karan? judges are not there for themselves lawyers are there to make money judges are there to do a job the real stakeholder is the public because they are the ones who expect justice and they are the ones who pay the cost when there is injustice and they are consumers of justice
given your strong views, yes. both about the ineffective way the Supreme Court intends to improve the collegium system and your strong views in favor of the need for a National Judicial Appointments Commission, let me ask you this. When will the government reformulate the NGAC and attempt once again to present it through Parliament with the hope the Supreme Court will accept it? When will that happen? Well, um, that is frankly, I, I have no idea about that. That's in the hands of politicians. That's in the hands of politicians. They will decide what to do, what time is but good. But are they thinking along those lines? I don't know. I have no idea. My last question. Yes. The collegium at the moment is not functioning. A moment ago you pointed out it was inexplicable, if not unforgivable, that it wasn't functioning. And yet, Chief Justice Datu has recommended Justice Thakur as his successor without the collegium functioning and deciding or giving him any advice. No, there I must tell you, uh, this is a convention which is followed for the last so many years that it is only the Chief Justice who recommends the successor. No need for a collegium. No, there's no need for a collegium. It's really a formality. It doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean so much. There's no it's just to set the process into motion. So there's no impropriety of any sort? No, here. none at all. This was a completely correct course oh, of yes, action yes. for Chief Justice Datu. Absolutely correct and done at the right time, which is broadly a month before he demits office. It is to set the process into motion so that the Ministry of Justice can then start preparing the background. Mr. Hothke, I have to thank you for not only answering my questions fully, but answering them in detail and with examples, so that lay people for whom this is otherwise not just a technical, but often a perplexing subject, can fully understand. I'm deeply grateful. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Nisaga mama, mani pamaga, ni pama, ni pamaga, sa ni pama, ni sa pasa. Jaha tak yade, yada ti rahegi.